At the end of the operation, more penicillin is used. This time, as a powder dusted onto the wound itself. But this is only the first step in the battle against the germs which are endangering Nat's life. To keep them under control, penicillin has to be run continuously into his body. Penicillin was discovered by Professor Fleming at St. Mary's Hospital in London. One day, in the year 1928, he was examining some sepsis germs grown on jelly before sending them to be destroyed. He noticed that one of the dishes had gone mouldy and that round the patch of green mould, the sepsis germs were dying. He put that dish on one side for a moment. Then he examined this strange mould. He found that it belonged to the family of moulds called penicillium. The original spore had probably drifted in with the air, and growing on the jelly in the dish had produced a mould which was an enemy of the sepsis germs. He grew the same mould in other dishes, and found that it stopped the growth of some kinds of germs, among them the staphylococci, which cause skin diseases, infections in wounds and bones, and sometimes septicemia. Although on others it had no effect, some powerful natural antiseptic was obviously exuded from the mould. Professor Fleming christened the broth containing the antiseptic penicillin and published the results of his work in a paper in 1929. It was not until 1938 at the Sir William Dunn School of Pathology at Oxford that the next development in the story of penicillin took place. Here, Professor Florey, pathologist, who had been interested for many years in natural substances which affect germs, and his colleague, Dr. Chain, biochemist, planned a wide investigation of antiseptics produced by molds and germs. They decided to make a fresh study of penicillin. To obtain material with which to work, spores of the mold penicillium were sown in sugar solution. After nine days, the mold had grown and in the liquid, under the mould, was the penicillin. The first job was to extract it from the solution as a definite substance, so that it would be possible to find out both what penicillin was and what it would do. The problem had many aspects, and gradually, as work progressed, several specialists were brought in. A member of the team, Dr. Heatley, also a biochemist, had developed a method by which the strength of the penicillin solutions could be tested quickly and accurately. This was a great help, and by means of this method and the chemical experience gained, they were finally able to obtain penicillin in powder form, still very impure, but already a powerful germ killer. Professor Gardner found out how much penicillin was necessary to kill disease germs and added some new ones to the list of those which penicillin would kill. He also discovered that penicillin was active even in the presence of pus and blood. Dr. Abraham, an organic chemist, joined in. His job was to purify penicillin so that they could find out what kind of chemical substance it was. Dr. Jennings, pathologist, studied the effects of penicillin on blood. The purified penicillin would not harm the useful white corpuscles in the blood, but would stop the growth of harmful germs. The next step showed that considerable amounts of penicillin could be injected into the bloodstreams of living mice and not harm them. In this harmlessness, penicillin differed from all other such products of molds and germs, and indeed from nearly all other antiseptics. The team now faced the crucial experiment. Here were mice infected with disease. Would penicillin kill the germs and cure the mice? Months of patient work had led up to this moment. The penicillin was injected into the mice. It attacked the germs and the mice were cured. Penicillin passed its first test.
team now knew what penicillin would do in the laboratory. The next step was to use it on human beings. Research workers in hospitals joined the team and started using the small amounts of penicillin available. After some setbacks, the results were favorable and encouraged the team continued their work. In the meantime, Professor Florey and Dr. Heatley had been to America. In the United States, the government and the commercial firms began a search for the best way of increasing production. Penicillin had taken its place among the great discoveries of science. The problem was now one of production. This was still entirely dependent on the amount of mold which could be grown and the time that it took to grow. D-Day was approaching. Penicillin was of vital importance. It was essential to find out whether it could be used to treat battle casualties. In 1943, the War Office sent out a medical research team to North Africa. Army surgeons tried the new method suggested on wounded evacuated from Italy. The results were excellent. The War Office made plans for every casualty to receive penicillin treatment from the front line to the base hospital. Russian scientists in Moscow were visited by an Anglo-American mission, which included Professor Florey and Dr. Sanders, who gave them the latest information about the new antiseptic. To make facilities available for large-scale production, the order went out, priority for penicillin. In spite of war conditions, many firms took up the new and difficult job, and thousands of bottles containing the liquid nourishment were prepared. They were inoculated with pure penicillium spores. In specially built rooms at controlled temperatures, the mold grew on the liquid. After the mold had exuded the penicillin into it, the liquid was poured off. The strength of the brew had to be tested at every stage. But from a whole day's work, only this much penicillin-containing liquid was obtained. From this, the penicillin had to be extracted by a series of long and complicated processes. Finally, they produced the vital yellow powder. Work on penicillin continues. The first highly purified penicillin in crystalline form was obtained by American scientists and then by Dr. Chain and Dr. Abraham at Oxford. This formed the basis for fresh work. Instead of growing the mold slowly and then extracting the penicillin, could the antiseptic itself be made in the laboratory? The Oxford chemical team set out to find what penicillin is made up of what its component parts are. And this was perhaps the most difficult task of all. They had very little penicillin to work with, and under many conditions, it lost its power. For two years, they struggled with the problems involved. And then, at last, they were successful. The next step is to build the separate parts up again, and from them, make penicillin synthetically. Many scientists all over the world are engaged on this task. They hope that their work may also produce new forms of this great antiseptic with particular uses for individual diseases. Meanwhile, Nat is home. Penicillin has done its work of preventing infection. And very soon, he will be able to move about the wall. For him, as for so many other wounded men, penicillin has not only saved life or limb, it has reduced suffering and shortened the road to recovery. Some diseases which meant pain and uncertain cure are no longer feared. In others, certain death is saved. Penicillin, like radium, insulin, and the sulfonamides, is a great weapon for healing in man's battle against disease.